I am no stranger to risk. I have come face to face and hand to claw with some of the most ferocious and notorious animals on the planet. But this one was so much more. An activity like this is not risk free. My name is Mark Vince. For over five years, 500 videos, You're right, man. and over a million miles traveled around the globe, I have been here with you on Brave Wilderness. And through those thousands upon thousands of hours off trail with my two best friends, I have witnessed some of the most amazing spectacles imaginable. Oh, wow. I have stood amongst the shadows of mountains, of forests, of a cowboy hat, of some of the world's deadliest creatures, and most often, the shadow of my own camera. Then last year, I decided to step out and take my place in front of the lens to pursue my lifelong dream of ocean exploration. And since that day, there has been a singular entity, an enigma that has drawn me back to the blue wilderness. But before I was to meet this creature of epic lore and mystery, I had to first pass a series of tests to prepare myself. There were tiger sharks, hammerheads, and deep water dives. And not simply for any certification, but to prove to myself, to know that I was ready. Ready to meet my fate beneath the waves. Ready to come face to face with the great white shark. There it is. That's our ship. Today is the day we are here in Mexico about to go on our first ever Great White Shark Adventure. Actually, I take that back. This is our second attempt. The first attempt didn't go as planned in the Farallon Islands, but I've got a feeling this one's going to be a whole lot different. Upon leaving shore, I could feel the hair on the back of my neck stand up. Would this be a gateway to the next phase of my adventures? Or would this be my last? I am no stranger to risk. I have come face to face and hand to claw with some of the most ferocious and notorious animals on the planet. But this one was so much more. Inevitable, intentional, imperative to my quest as an explorer. Welcome to Guadalupe, a remote volcanic island 175 nautical miles off the coast of Mexico's Baja Peninsula. This towering mountainous expanse of prehistoric Earth will serve as a backdrop to my greatest adventure to date. We made it. Because if there's one place on Earth to find the world's largest predatory shark, this is it. What's cool about Guadalupe is it's kind of like the sister to the Farallon Islands that we filmed at before. Unfortunately, we didn't see any sharks in the Farallons, but down here, the sharks come in because of the seals. They have three different species of pinniped here in Guadalupe. They've got their endemic fur seal population. They've got California sea lions. And then, of course, they have northern elephant seals, all of which are on the menu for the great white shark. And the place we are at right now is known as the kill zone. This is the space between the feeding grounds where the seals need to hunt their food and the shore where they rest during the day. And as you can imagine, in that space in between is the great white shark's favorite buffet. But our goal isn't to see seals getting eaten while we're out here. Our goal is to get under the water in the realm of the great white shark so we can get the cameras up close and personal with one of the world's top marine predators. Our home in this mystical place will be none other than the Socorro Vortex of the Pelagic Fleet. This ship and its crew have been making the voyage to Guadalupe for years and have been assisting in shark research and conservation all along the way. The very first step to try to protect sharks it's to get in the water with them. Once you're in the water with them, it's a completely different perspective you will get forever. So one of the biggest differences between what we try to do in the Farallon Islands and what we're doing out here in Guadalupe is this. We actually get to use a tractant, AKA bait, to draw on the sharks close to the cages and therefore up close to the cameras. All right guys, I think it's time to get suited up because it's about to be our turn to get in the water. As I began to suit up, reality sunk in. 
I do need to say, this is the point where the nerves start to kick in. And it's not because I'm scared, it's not out of fear, it's healthy because an activity like this is not risk-free. Even though we're with one of the best crews in the world when it comes to diving in cages with great white sharks, we still have to have our wits about us. Anything can happen. We're talking a ton plus animal that can be ferocious in a moment's notice and they can literally rip these cages apart. In fact, one of my friends caught footage of a shark entering a shark cage and they had to pop the top where the divers are supposed to come out to release the shark, not the diver. So we definitely have to keep our eyes peeled, be aware at all times, watch each other's backs when we're in the cages because literally anything can happen. Just because there's bars in front of us, that's not any sign for complacency when you're in the water with an animal that formidable. The few steps between the deck and the shark cage created a bridge to the world of the great white. My heart began to race, but this time, the nerves I felt were more distinct. This was an adrenaline rush from the excitement of a life's dream nearing closer with each and every step. My moment had finally arrived. Here we go. As I entered the cool 65 degree water, my eyes began to adjust and I became aware of the endless blue void that lurked below me. The sunlight danced through the 12,000 feet of water surrounding the landscape of the island, and there was no bottom in sight, meaning the sharks could be anywhere and come from any direction. Looking around, scanning for our first shark, I was in awe of the clarity of the water and the abundance of fish in the area. Our main challenge at this point was getting properly positioned. The strong currents threw us around the cages like ragdolls. So to keep the camera steady and our bodies from bouncing off the walls, we fixed our feet to the railing and held tightly with our free hands. Watching from below the surface, I could see the occasional splash from above as the crew tossed bait lines into the water. Knowing full well that each attempt could be the line to draw the apex predators from below. We waited, patiently scanning the blue abyss for any shadows or signs of movement. Minutes seemed like hours, but then, without much warning, it happened. From the distance, a dark shape began to appear. It crept toward us slowly, and then suddenly, it was right in front of us. Wow, I couldn't believe my eyes. What I've been witnessing for years on Shark Week was right in front of my lens. Finally, I was in the presence of a great white shark. It thrashed toward the bait and missed, but after a quick lap around our cage, it disappeared again. As fast as the giant flashed into view, it was gone. But this was proof of victory. We were going to be seeing sharks today, and hopefully, lots of them. On average, great white sharks will have up to 300 teeth in their mouths at any given time. And these teeth are arranged in up to seven rows with the first two known as their working teeth. As you can see by our footage, their attacks are calculated and precise. The torpedo shape of their body allows the great white to accelerate up to speeds of, get this, 35 miles an hour and strike with a force of 29 Gs. So forget about the bite for a second. The impact alone is enough to kill prey all by itself. As I calmly observe the frenzy of sharks surrounding the cage, I am reminded that I am in their world. Not only am I observing them, they are observing me. Witnessing a strange visitor in a metal cage, they would come closer and closer with each pass for a better look. And locking eyes with a great white shark is something that I'll never forget as long as I live. As my time in the cage came to a close, I couldn't help but keep my camera rolling. We had seen many impressive sharks today, but I just had this feeling that something big was about to happen. When suddenly, a giant silhouette charged from straight beneath, and with its sights locked on the prize, it lunged at full kill speed. And pow! I could not believe it. It's rare to see from the surface, let alone from underwater, but what we had just witnessed was a full breach. Behold, the full fury of the great white shark. 
now feeling extremely happy with our footage, and after hours underwater, it was finally time to return to the safety of the boat. Oh my goodness, what an epic great white shark adventure that was. For our very first one, I don't think we could have asked for any more. The surface cages did not disappoint. We had all kinds of action. We had encounters right at the cage. We had bites at the bait. We had surface breaches. Huge thanks to the Socorro Vortex crew for helping us out and keeping us safe on today's adventure. It's no surprise that these sharks are referred to as great. They are truly a perfected product of evolution and largely differ from any of the previous sharks we've encountered on Blue Wilderness. Great whites are intelligent creatures, highly inquisitive by nature, and as we clearly witness today, master hunters of the deep. We'd like to give an extra special thank you to the captain and crew of the Socorro Vortex. To learn more about the ways you can visit Guadalupe or to support shark conservation, please visit their website at www.vortexliveaboard.com. Welcome back to Guadalupe, Mexico, the site of our very first great white shark encounters. Aboard the Socorro Vortex, we traveled over 175 miles to this prehistoric island in hopes of getting up close with the world's largest predatory shark. Here we go. And as millions of you witnessed, that's exactly what we did. But what if I were to tell you that we really didn't come all of this way for an ordinary shark cage adventure. What if I were to tell you the real reason we came this far was to embark on the single most daring mission we've ever attempted? Today, I will take you even closer to the most famous set of jaws on Earth in a one-of-a-kind shark cage submarine. By now, I'm sure everyone watching this video has at least seen images of a great white shark before. But have you ever seen a Spock? Probably not, because this self-propelled ocean cage is highly experimental and can only be piloted by one of two people in the entire world. Now, the sharks will let us get close in this, or oh, yeah. are they gonna get yeah. close to us? Both. Both, yeah. Meet Eric Hager, our pilot for today's mission and a world-renowned marine biologist and ocean photographer. So no matter what, we're not gonna sink. Well, that's when the, that, that would be the that's second not, step. That's not, that's not what I wanted to hear. <laughs> I want you to say, yeah, we're not going to sink. You are in charge of monitoring your own air supply system. I won't be able to monitor that. If you run out of air, it's going to be your fault. You're probably asking yourself, or maybe even yelling at your screen, why are you putting yourself in this situation? Well, what we know of these mysterious creatures has been limited to years of topside observation, cage diving, and the infrequent free dive experiences that only a few have lived to speak of. So this vehicle truly represents an evolution in our understanding of the world's most famous shark, which is also perhaps the world's most famous animal. All right, so we had our debriefing with Eric on the self-propelled ocean cage, AKA Spock. And I have to say, I am so excited to get out there and in the water in this research vehicle. This is going to be probably one of the most unique experiences you could have with great white sharks in a safe way without free diving. I mean, certainly someday I'd love to have the opportunity to free dive with great white sharks, but this is about as close as you're gonna get here in Guadalupe. And now all we need to do is go get suited up, get our cameras ready and get out there for some action. As if this activity in of itself wasn't dangerous enough, the technical nature of this dive was also quite daunting. I would need to wear a full face regulator in order to maybe have communication with the pilot. However, underwater comms are notoriously unreliable. I would also be wearing a pony bottle BC in the case of an emergency bailout, in which I would need to rip off my full face reg to use it. Not ideal. Additionally, I would be wearing nearly 30 pounds of weight without fins, and I would sink like a rock one foot outside the confines of the cage. Oh, and did I mention this was an experimental craft? The connections and critical mechanisms were all exposed and at risk of damage from the divers. If I were to kick one accidentally, it could prove catastrophic. Eric is in the Spock. I'm about to get in the Spock, and then we're about to go get up close. Okay, some giant giant we'll get in. okay here we go, guys. See ya. This was potentially the most dangerous step of the day, and potentially of my entire life. Jump in 
and miss grabbing the cage, you sink. Fast. This was a one-shot deal, a no-miss scenario. This wasn't just water. It might as well have been looking off a 50-story skyscraper. This was it. Woo. As soon as I got hold of the bar, I pulled myself into the cage. And what had seemed roomy on the deck had suddenly shrunk, and there was barely any room to move. All right, I'm all set. Ready to go. But what was worse, my headset was silent. The communications had already failed. Eric and I would rely solely on hand signals for the entirety of the dive. In a way, I was now completely on my own. Once settled and breathing normally, I set the cameras and gave Eric the signal to launch. In an instant, we were off. The rush of water pressing against me as we glided below the boat was much more intense than I expected. Great, another obstacle. After adapting to these new sensations, the environment came into view. Clear and brilliant blues to my sides and above with a dark, ominous floor below, which wasn't really a floor at all. Instead, literally thousands of feet of water. The sharks were all around us, yet none of them were in sight. So we began our descent in hopes of meeting a great white shark face to face. Eric zipped the Spock up and down, checking different depths for shadows and signs of movement. The thermoclines, or temperature layers, were dramatic. Each dive down would zap us with freezing cold water, and the light would retreat right along with it. It was very dark below 60 feet, a perfect environment for these sharks, as they have adapted retinas that are actually split, one part suited for surface light and one part adapted for darkness. And while we certainly require wetsuits to regulate our body temperatures to keep from hypothermia, the sharks are able to regulate their bodies all on their own. We had been looking for nearly 25 minutes without a single sign of a shark. But then, I saw a shadow to my right. It was big. I signaled to Eric to turn starboard, and as soon as he did, a great white swam into view. I should have been alarmed, the way it seemed to appear from nowhere. However, with my camera rolling, I was thrilled to feel our speed increase to keep up with the predator. I couldn't risk missing the shot. The shark easily outflanked us and for a moment seemed to be gone entirely. Then it quickly doubled back and was in front of us again. However, we never really got that close. A first sighting, yes, but the shot we were after, not at all. This adventure was far from over. After the relief of getting some footage had washed over me, I was back on the lookout. Great whites can grow up to one ton and over 18 feet in length, and swim at speeds in excess of 30 miles an hour. Even with the Spock to protect us, I couldn't help but feel completely outmatched. But who could blame me? It's not every day you find yourself in the kill zone, a favorite hunting ground of the Great White. Again, we dashed around the grounds. Only sardines and other fish came into view. And after 45 minutes, I began to think that was it. That was as close as we were going to get. When then, Eric suddenly turned. He must have seen something I hadn't. I knew we were near the boat, but I wasn't quite sure how close. And then I saw the shark. It was swimming straight for us. All I could do was breathe and keep my camera as steady as possible. This was it, the encounter of a lifetime. Time slowed in that moment, and as the shark moved and swam back around for an even closer look, 
the fact that I was being observed and calculated by this creature was unmistakable. A real connection between myself and the shark that I had been dreaming to meet had finally happened. As it turned and swam away, a sense of relief came over me. I was ready to be back on the boat, but I wanted to tell everyone the tale of how obvious and beneficial vessels like the Spock would be for revealing the true nature of this misunderstood species. I certainly would be walking away today with a brand new perspective that I never thought possible. Woo! We got really close okay. to a shark. That was awesome. That was the shot we needed. So much more intense than I thought it was going to be. Just give me a second. I need to like absorb the fact that I'm back on the boat. <laughs> wow. What an experience, getting to be in the realm of the great white shark in a shark cage submersible. Are you kidding me? That was the coolest thing I have ever done. The water viz got pretty bad at the end, but we did get to see some great white sharks up close. In fact, that last one I thought was gonna hit the camera. Huge thank you to the Sakura Vortex and all the crew that helped us out today. A special thanks to Eric for captaining the Spock and keeping me safe so I get those up close shots for everybody at home. As the boat departed back from the mainland, I couldn't help but be grateful for all that took place these last few days in Guadalupe. I knew I would be back. When? I don't really know. For another round in the Spock? Probably not. I won't lie, that was pretty crazy. <laughs> Sorry, Mom. Welcome to Tiger Beach, a world-famous destination for shark diving. More specifically, tiger shark diving. And not only will you see tiger sharks, you can encounter up to five different species. All formidable, all top marine predators, all on the same dive. And if that isn't intimidating enough, this would be our first shark dive ever. Mario, I'm usually really confident about everything we do, but today, man, I hope we didn't bite up more than you can chew. Regardless, I got your back. Got your back too, man. Let's right. do it. You ready? Ready. Let's do it. Well, with every shark dive comes the moment where you actually have to dive in with the sharks. That moment is right now. Oh boy. As I plunge beneath the surface, cool water rushed through my wetsuit, sending an instant shock up my spine. My eyes scrambled, struggling to adjust just as they always do when first entering the water. However, this time was different. This time, I knew I was completely surrounded by sharks. But something strange happened as the environment around me came into view. The nerves I felt above the water instantly vanished and were replaced by laser focus. In a snap, my vision and other senses elevated to a hyperstate, a sensation I had never felt until this very moment. Within these few but critical milliseconds, my entire perspective changed. I was indeed aware of the countless lemon sharks around me, but I could also sense their intentions were not to attack. If anything, they seemed curious. Oddly enough, I actually began to feel calm. Then I quickly remembered my training to not stay at the surface in the feeding zone. So with that, I began my slow descent to the bottom. Water clarity was incredible. Light beams cut through the surface and glistened all around me. Sharks and reef fish of all sizes float in and out of view in perfect harmony. And my heightened sense of awareness made this journey all the more spectacular. As I neared the bottom, the crew came into focus. Only another 10 feet to go. And like the lunar module coming in for a moon landing, I prepared for impact. Then with a slow and subtle thud, I had landed at Tiger Beach. The thud quickly triggered my mind and body into action mode. It was time to survey the sharks I could see, but more importantly, start searching for the ones I could not. Lemons, reef, and nurse sharks circled the group 
making an eclectic mix of predators. And although they were pretty good size, they nearly vanished in plain sight. My eyes were searching for one thing and one thing only, tiger sharks. I know it's hard to fathom how a giant 10 foot plus shark could literally appear out of nowhere, but trust me, they really can. And the most dangerous shark is always the one behind you. Suddenly, a dark shadow began to appear, moving like a stealthy submarine from the edges of the ocean. My heart must have been racing a million miles a second. And then, a quick burst of adrenaline allowed me to process the fact that an enormous tiger shark was headed straight for me. I couldn't believe my eyes as the shark glided past. It was so big. Its mass literally displaced the water around me, pushing my body aside by the power of its wake. And just as I was coming to grips with the reality of the situation, like a phantom, it was gone. To be honest, I never imagined I would find myself in this situation, kneeling at the bottom of the ocean, face to face with the tiger shark. And the crazy part was, I couldn't wait for it to come back. Knowing where the sharks are at all times is the only way to prevent an accidental attack, which is also the most frequent kind of attack that occurs in these situations. And knowing the location of the sharks is a team effort. Everyone checking their surroundings and signaling to unsuspecting divers of a shark's whereabouts. Sharks by their very nature are curious. You can sense this immediately being in their presence. Their eyes constantly scanning, their movements subtle and calculated. But the one thing sharks also do is investigate with their mouths. And this is not what you want to happen to your body 40 feet below the surface. Even a taste test in these situations can be fatal. So knowing where and how a shark is approaching you is vital to avoiding any regrettable situations. When we first arrived at the bottom, the sharks were still very cautious, circling us at a distance of 15 feet or more. But with every lap, they became more and more confident especially when the dive master began to introduce food. Seeing the sharks chow down giant chunks of fish was a quick reminder of the seriousness of those teeth. The way they could just devour fish after fish after fish was extremely impressive. In fact, their jaws are so strong, they can even crack the shell of a sea turtle. While in feeding mode, this initiated the sharks to investigate the rest of us almost as if they were thinking, who else has some tasty fish for me? Well, none of us did. So when this happened, it created some spectacular flybys. One after another, they would approach and veer to the right, and then to the left, and sometimes right overhead. The overhead shots were by far the most fun to film. In fact, the sharks got so close, you could actually see the electroreceptors in their snouts, which are used to detect prey. At this point, Mario Coyote and I were having a blast. Even Jonathan was getting into it. I could tell how mesmerized we had all become by these apex predators. Their intelligence, just as formidable, as their jaws. Then, just as their curiosity and comfort levels hit their peak, came the contacts. As scary as this sounds, it's actually quite simple to redirect them away from you. The key to this maneuver is to gently palm down the shark's snout and push it away from you, letting its momentum do all the work. Check this out. Look at that barrel roll. Believe it or not, it was actually kind of fun having these contacts. But then there are times when the contacts get a little bit dicey. And to no fault of his own, Coyote, well, let's just watch. Yikes, that was close. So, so close. In fact, let's watch that again in slow-mo.
See, one thing you don't want to happen when making contact with any shark is place your hands or any part of your body under its nose. This will trigger a reflex that drops the shark's jaws, and yeah, you can kind of fill in the rest on why this is bad. Good thing Coyote got lucky and was able to quickly avoid that chomp, or this would have turned into a horrific bite episode. Definitely not something we ever want to happen. After Coyote's close call, we all realized our air was running low, and it was time to head back to the boat. One by one, we ascended to the safety stop just below the ship. At this point, I could see the smiles all around. We had done it. We successfully completed our first major shark dive. And what made it most special is that we had done it together. Woo! That was pretty amazing, guys. Wow, were those some up-close encounters with some gorgeous sharks. I don't think you get much closer to the tiger shark than I got on that dive. Amazing. Woo. All right, let me get this gear off. While this is only the beginning of our explorations on Blue Wilderness, I will always look back on this adventure as the one that truly reshaped my perspective of the ocean. And more importantly, of sharks. While the lore and fictions of pop culture have painted them as menacing monsters of the deep, the reality is they are highly intelligent and inquisitive creatures, rightfully deserving to be respected, but above all, cherished for what they truly are. Survivors of time, ancient relics of an abyss that is millions upon millions of years old. In many ways, they have already discovered the secrets of the ocean. Our goal is to learn from them, and with any luck, uncover some of its mysteries for ourselves. Right now, I am out tide pulling in Eastern Australia in search of the deadliest creature on the planet. The Blue Ring Octopus has one of the most toxic venoms on Earth, and if we're lucky enough to find one, I'm going to attempt to touch it with my bare hands. But first things first, let's get looking. From experience tide pulling, the best results are usually from the edge. The further out you can go, the better. An octopus can change the texture of its skin, and it would just look like any of these. Now I've struck out on all three previous occasions trying to locate a blue ring octopus. I'm hoping fourth time's a charm. The difference this time is I'm searching with my good friend Miller Wilson, who has seen blue rings in these tide pools before. It's very hard to pick a octopus that's a master of camouflage out from this environment. It's about to be low tide, and this is probably one of the most dangerous tide pools that I have ever searched. So wearing some nice protective shoes, gloves, I don't really want to handle the octopus, but the gloves should protect me just in case. And of course, we still need to watch our steps because if you look at this, all these rocks out here, exactly like a stonefish. And this is stonefish territory. The stonefish is the world's most venomous fish. If you step on one, your boots will not protect you. A single sting from a stonefish can be excruciating and can even be deadly. But no octopus. Flipping's not really doing it. So I'm just gonna cruise to cover a lot of ground, looking for movement. A lot of times I do see octopus moving from pocket to pocket, but they slink along the surface. So I'm just looking for any movement right now. Any movement, we're getting it though, feel it. Oh my God, I got an octopus. I got a blue ring, guys. right here. There it is. I missed it. It's right in here. It's right here. How could I miss that? That was it. Got it. Oh my gosh. We got one. Are you kidding me? Yes. Boom, baby. Boom. Yes. Holy cow. Miller, we're good. We got one. Can you help me get out of the net? So you'll see I'm wearing gloves, guys, for a reason right now. This is, this is a really good way to get a nip. 
That is not what I want. Let's talk about what we found. Right there, in my hand, is the most dangerous animal on the planet, at least when it comes to venom. Nothing in the animal kingdom is more toxic than this tiny little octopus. And yes, I am nervous about it, but before the end of this video, I will officially touch with my bare hand the most dangerous and toxic creature on Earth. There are actually four described varieties of blue ring octopus. This one is the blue lined octopus. It's the only one in the family that has these really cool, vivid blue pinstripes surrounding the body. It's almost like blue tiger stripes. So if this animal is at all threatened here, I wanna show you what it does. See that? Look at those rings go. Is that cool or what? Oh, oh, oh. Stay down, stay down. If the octopus is at all agitated, not only does it flare up the rings on its arms, but those lines on its body glow. <laughs> Back up, I'm toxic. That's your abosomatic warning. And if you don't listen to me, I'm gonna give you a nip. And they show these vivid display warnings, not only for predators, but they also do it while they're hunting. They will do it to confuse or startle their would-be prey. This is what our octopus friend here is out hunting. This is a type of shore crab, but this would be the perfect food for the octopus. All right, we're gonna let this crab go. A single bite from this octopus could kill over 20 human beings. Needless to say, if I get nipped by this creature, that'll be the last nip I ever take. Now these octopus are nocturnal and they are masters of camouflage. It's normal color pattern perfectly blends in to this silty environment. They have three hearts that pump blue blood. They also have nine brains. One central brain to run the entire nervous system, but then at the base of each arm, they have another brain. And you can see there that little beak holds two venom sacs. And it's actually a toxin that it doesn't even produce itself. But it actually picks up through bacteria that it finds in the environment through other organisms in this tide pool, and it collects this bacteria in its saliva glands, and when it uses its beak to bite into its prey or a predator for escape, it will actually inject saliva into the wound. Once this saliva enters the bloodstream, you get infected with TTX. No animal has as lethal of a dose as the blue ring octopus does. If you get even a micro amount of TTX in your bloodstream, all you can do is be put on life support and hope that eventually your body works through the toxin on its own. And here's the worst part about it. While you might be in complete paralysis, you are lucid. There are survivors that have lived to tell the tale of having people try to resuscitate them, giving active CPR, and they weren't able to communicate, but they remember everything. And a lot of people get bitten by these octopus because of mistaken identity. You'll come out to a local beach and type, well guys, turn your cameras right now. This is an active beach. People take their dogs and kids and play on this beach and these animals live all along the coastline. Now that's not to scare you. Obviously we're out here actively looking for them. They're hard to find, but people do unfortunately come into contact with these octopus and they will pick them up, play with them, and in that process take a bite, which is completely painless by the way. Initial symptoms are going to be things like tingling, difficulty breathing, difficulty thinking, loss of your motor skills, wobbly walking. If you think you are ever bitten by a blue ring octopus and you start to have symptoms, you have to be rushed to the hospital as fast as you can. We're talking like life flight situation because you only have a matter of minutes before your whole nervous system starts to shut down and you're no longer able to breathe. And saying all that, while holding the octopus in your hand, it's hard to remember the last time I was this nervous in the presence of an animal. All right, the time has come for something that I've thought a lot about. Because I know the only way that this octopus has the ability to envenomate you is a bite with its beak, I'm going to attempt to touch with my bare hand the most lethal, toxic animal on the planet. In order to do that, I'm gonna just dump out this water. Look at that. 
the octopus is trying to mimic the color of the cube. Rest assured, this is just a camouflage tactic. They are masters at this. That octopus is still very much able to pounce and bite. They can spend extended periods out of water. All right, so just so you guys know, uh, if this blue ring does snare me, we're going to the hospital on three. One, two, three. That made me nervous. All right, lid back on. I don't think I was just bitten now, but I'm, I'm not completely sure. I had to take a break, guys, because like I'm definitely feeling a little lightheaded, like major anxiety. That animal right there, if you get bit, it's game over, it's lights out. Guys, I am like shaking right now, like my feet are tingling. Things that you normally wouldn't pick up on, like heart rate, how I'm breathing, tingle feeling. I got just from like all the adrenaline pumping through my body um, and the the emotions are intense. Super intense. Whew, gotta shake that off. The anxiety that I'm experiencing on camera is real as I had almost identical symptoms to that of a blue ring bite. While I was 99% sure I wasn't bitten, we had to closely monitor my symptoms until we deemed it safe enough to continue filming. The symptoms of these bites can be subtle and can be hard to differentiate from anxiety and panic from other sources of stress. Please, never attempt to do what you are seeing in this video. I cannot stress enough, if you are bitten by a blue ring octopus, you must seek medical attention immediately. I think I'm all right, I think I'm okay to continue, let's keep going. Okay, I, it's been a while since I've had this kind of reaction to being in an encounter with an animal. Like it's like my first time seeing a venomous snake. It's like whew, all kinds of emotions right now just brushing up against one in the tide pool while you're walking around, if you accidentally touch one, you're gonna be just fine. It's like every other octopus. The difference only occurs when you take a bite from the beak right there. What's going on, Brave Crew? We're back in Queensland, Australia, about to head off for another epic tide pool adventure. And we absolutely love these tide pools because they're jam-packed with super unique creatures, including some of the most deadly on Earth. So if you're ready, it looks like the tide's headed out, which means it's time for us to get our feet wet and try to find something we've never seen before. Okay, let's go. So you'll notice that all of the surface of the rocks right now is wet and slippery. We wanna move extremely slow. The last thing we want is for someone to take a nasty spill because we're moving too fast. Looks like there might be some more pockets ahead. Let's head up a little bit further this way and make moves toward the point. Hey guys, I think I got a crab here. Got him, ha ha. This is a swift-footed shore crab and they are very difficult to catch because like their name, they're very swift. Now, these crabs are very, very common in these tide pools. In fact, we were here last year and I caught one and took a photograph and put it on Instagram and it was one of my most liked Instagram posts of our entire production last year. But unfortunately we could not catch one again to get it on camera. So I'm really happy that I was able to find one today to show you guys. This one does feel like it did just molt, which is perhaps why it was a little easier to catch and maybe a little bit slower. I can tell that because its shell is slightly soft. But what's really cool about crabs is they're sort of like the custodians of the tide pools. They're like the cleanup crew. They're opportunistic omnivores. So they're out here eating a lot of the dead things and all the carrion. And they also eat some of the plant life, including some of the algae and some of the plankton scum that washes up. So they do a very good job at managing these tide pools and keeping them pristine for all the other creatures. So thank you for doing that. And we're gonna let you go now so you can go about your day. See you, buddy. Thanks for hanging out. There he goes. Oh, look at this. This tide pool is brimming with life. It's a lot of fish. A lot of fish around here. Wait a second. That is a cone snail. And cone snails are very venomous. So what I wanna do real quick is I'm going to place the cone snail on this glove. This is actually sting proof and bite proof to use when you handle venomous creatures. All right. 
There you have it. You can see that patterning on the shell, and that's how I was able to identify it as a cone snail. Some might say this is actually an aposomatic coloration because of how venomous this creature is. You can actually see its foot reaching out to right itself right now. That's pretty cool. All right, so let's talk about what makes a cone snail such a lethal predator. They're actually armed with a very specialized radular tooth up by their mouth that can actually shoot a venomous barb out like a harpoon to dispatch their prey. Now this barb is laced with a neurotoxic venom, so it, it immediately paralyzes the prey so then the snail can catch up and consume it because some of them actually eat fish. And those cone snails are actually very dangerous to human beings. So if you're ever gonna come out shelling or pick up a snail in this region of the world, you definitely wanna be aware of what a cone snail looks like before you do so. All right, let's put it back and see what else we can find out here in the tide pools. Well, I have good news and bad news. The good news is we've already found some pretty cool animals. The bad news is the weather that's been pushing through the last few days is really not letting this tide drop quite as low as I thought it would. So I have a GoPro wearable that I'm gonna throw on my shoulder and I'm gonna head out there with this net, get in those rocks and hope to get lucky. Whoa, I'm glad I moved that mic pack. Nothing around here, I'm gonna move through this way. Getting a little precarious, oh boy. Woo! I'm really glad the mic pack's on this side and not that side, because I just got drilled. The storm surge is for real. Okay, let's make a way around here. Getting soaked, nothing. Seen a bunch of fish darting in and out. Hold on. What's that? There's something right there. An eel! Oh my goodness. Check this out. Wow. Look at that. Okay, I can't keep it out of water for too long. We gotta go find a spot to do the presentation. Let's go over here to this pocket. Wow. I think what I wanna do to present this eel because I can't really handle it out of the water I'm gonna put it in one of our cubes. Here, uh, can somebody hold that eel in the water there, just like that? Okay, cool. I'm gonna get my pack off. Let's uh, fill this up with water. Okay, this is a delicate little maneuver. Now, got this real quick. Okay, got it. Perfect. Yes. First things first, let's talk about the type of eel that we found here. This is a snowflake eel. It's called a snowflake eel because as you can see on its side through the center line, it has all these beautiful patterns in the shape of snowflakes. Now, an eel is actually a fish, not a snake. A lot of people confuse these animals with snakes, with sea snakes, and they are not venomous like a sea snake at all. Although they do have razor sharp teeth. In fact, they have two rows of teeth on the top, one row of teeth on the bottom, and then get this, inside their throat, they actually have another set of jaws called the pharyngeal jaws, which is an inner jaw structure that it uses to actually munch on its meals and draw in food as it has the rest of the prey item clasped in those front teeth, which is pretty creepy if you think about it, but a highly adapted mechanism that has allowed these eels to thrive in ecosystems like these tide pools in Australia. Wow, do you see that? It's trying to bite its reflection. Now eels in particular are actually Fairly aggressive animals are actually one of the animals we have to worry the most about when we're out there diving. They don't really back down. They're very courageous creatures and they're not really afraid of human beings. And they have been known to attack divers at times when you get too close. So whenever we see eels underwater, we always wanna keep our safe distance from them. But in a unique situation like this, I'm able to take an eel and put it in a container and get it right up close to the camera. That is so amazing. Now, eels, have extremely poor eyesight. Even though it has very beautiful eyes, those bright yellow eyes on each side of its head, uh, they really can't see very well, so they rely heavily on their sense of smell. Their sense of smell is incredible. In fact, if we get a tight enough shot, you can see it has these little yellow appendages coming out of its nostrils, and it can use those to direct its sense of smell. So it's a pretty cool little adaptation that it has. And these animals, like most mores, can filter water by opening and closing their mouths and then dragging the water across their gills for respiration. Well, I say that caps off an excellent adventure today. We came back out to Australia's tide pools to find something we've never found before, and lo and behold, we find our very first eel. Welcome back to Tiger Beach, the site of our first ever shark dive on Blue Wilderness. 
if you want to see sharks, like a ton of sharks, you come here. Tiger Beach is a small, pristine white sand flat about an hour's boat ride from West End Grand Bahama. And it's one of the few places on Earth where you can see up to five species of shark all at the same time. Divers who make the pilgrimage here are rewarded with the chance to swim with scores of reef and nurse sharks, dozens upon dozens of lemon sharks, and if they're lucky, massive hammerhead and tiger sharks. The last time we entered this warm, crystal clear water, we found ourselves in the middle of a shark frenzy. We swam alongside an incredible hammerhead, and Coyote and I got up close and personal with a massive tiger shark. Well, maybe a little too close in the case of Coyote. So how do we top that? Well, on this episode of Blue Wilderness, we're going back in the water, but this time, we're waiting until the sun goes down. All right, guys. Well, the sun is setting at Tiger Beach, and we just started shark diving yesterday. Never been night diving before, but somebody thought it was a good idea we go diving with sharks at night. Was that you? Definitely was not No, me. no, it was this guy. Oh. It's gonna be fine, you guys. I mean, <laughs> I don't know. Is this a good idea for guys who haven't gone, you know, night diving at all? What's the worst that can happen? I mean, we're surrounded by sharks. Right, but you know, they're probably sleeping. And we can't see. Wait, don't <laughs> sharks feed at night? Aren't they nocturnal predators? It's well, gonna be fine. We're gonna give it a shot, guys. So let's get geared up, get in the water with the sharks at night. This dive into the darkness will test my resolve more than almost anything I've ever done before. But that's what drives me forward. At the core of every grand adventure lies a thin line between thrill and fear. And the moments where your nerves start to scream, turn around, go back, is exactly when the teammates next to you matter the most. I'll tell you what, if I was nervous about diving with sharks during the day, I'm very nervous about <laughs> diving with sharks at night. <laughs> Well, in case it's the last time, I'm Mark Vins. Mario's already down there. It's time to go dive with sharks at night. As soon as we dipped below the surface, the world opened up. The last bit of twilight after sunset, combined with the white sands of Tiger Beach, allowed for a lot more visibility than we could have ever expected. But as we neared the bottom, the fleeting light that remained began to disappear. And so did our peripheral vision. Hey, Mario, watch out. There's a, yep, big tiger shark right behind you. Within minutes, the entire landscape turned pitch black, and our only field of view was directly in front of us. Other divers in the distance appeared as alien craft with orb-like lights designating their location. With ominous shadows stirring the now murky water, we were surrounded on all sides by two things that have terrified humans since the beginning. Sharks and darkness. But our focus was sharp, and as soon as we got our bearings, our fear was gone, mostly. And then we noticed something we didn't expect to see at night, color. You see, water is excellent at absorbing color from natural light. The deeper you go, the more color disappears. Red is the first to be absorbed, then orange, and then yellow, the same order as the colors of the rainbow. At our depth during the day, the reef can look, well, pretty bland and washed out. But under the cover of night, our powerful dive lights illuminated a completely new world that had been right in front of us the entire time. Even the fish were more vibrant. And then, while we were all completely mesmerized by the colors of the reef, from out of the darkness, ghostly figures flew gracefully into view. These rays are filter-feeding fish. Their flight pulls plankton and other nutrients into their systems, 
and spreads water across their gills, allowing them to breathe. Like spaceships flying across our night sky, just as fast as they appeared, they were gone. The rays may have vanished, but if there's one constant at Tiger Beach, it's, well, sharks. And more specifically, tiger sharks. We knew they were out there, but at night, we couldn't see them until they were right in front of us. They drifted in and out of our light like phantoms. The effect was chilling and surreal, and so unnerving, in fact, that I started to actually become numb to it. Here I am, sitting at the bottom of a pitch black ocean, surrounded by deadly nocturnal hunters, and I'm totally at their mercy. And then, suddenly, we came upon something that would change my perspective of sharks forever. It was a lemon shark, and it appeared to be, well, sleeping. Okay, so sharks don't actually sleep, at least not like we sleep, but some sharks, like nurse sharks or this lemon shark, go into restful periods that appear like sleep. But trust me, this shark was still wide awake and ready to defend itself against anything, including a curious first-time night diver. But did that stop me? Nope. This would be the perfect opportunity to get some great close-ups of that shark. And of course, it's razor-sharp teeth. Lemon sharks can grow up to 10 feet long and weigh over 400 pounds. But despite their imposing size, they tend to be gentle giants and are not responsible for any known human fatalities. Although, like any shark, they will bite if provoked. They can be found in shallow waters and hunt with their incredible electroreceptors. And just in case you're wondering, they do have a slightly yellow tinge to their skin, you know, like a lemon. Gentle or not, I knew this sleeping giant was still an apex predator capable of inflicting life-threatening injuries. And the last thing I wanted to do was provoke it, especially at night this far from shore. But we filmed with grizzly bears and badgers. This was my chance. I had to get the shot. And to my surprise, I was able to lie right next to the nearly 10-foot shark. This was amazing, a life-changing experience to say the least. And now I would never approach a tiger shark or other top land predator like this, but laying there beside this incredible creature, I could sense its gentle nature. And it became clear that it had accepted my presence and was allowing us to film with it. And then I reached out, testing its trust I couldn't believe it. It actually let me make contact. I was literally petting a shark. This chance encounter cultivated within me a growing sense of connection, not only to this creature, but to its entire aquatic realm. Swimming during the day in a frenzy of tiger sharks, and now petting a lemon shark on my first night dive, reminded me of how misunderstood these animals are. Our fear of them, like our fear of the dark, is really just a fear of the unknown. Every single time we go out for a blue wilderness adventure, we've managed to see something unexpected. And this incredible dive, our first night dive, was no exception. Swimming among them and literally lying beside them in the darkness of Tiger Beach at night brought home to me more than ever how meaningful our adventures could be to better understanding the mysteries of the ocean. Ascending back to the surface, I couldn't wait to celebrate with the team what had just happened. I knew that this night would be a story that Mario and I would share for many years to come. All right, we're back and we officially survived night dive number one. Now, I will say guys, 
It was a little intimidating when we first got in the water, but once we got down there, it was absolutely incredible. We saw all kinds of cool creatures from stingrays to sea cucumbers, and we even got to pet a lemon shark. Man, I definitely can't wait until our next night diving adventure. The oceans have depended on sharks for over 400 million years. They are true survivors. And yet, many species of shark are facing overfishing and habitat destruction, leaving their populations vulnerable and on the verge of collapse. These ancient animals are certainly not the nightmarish killing machines depicted in movies. They are a critical part of our ocean's ecosystem, and we must all do our part to ensure their home, the ocean, is protected. What's going on everybody and welcome back to another Blue Wilderness Adventure here on the edge of the Caribbean Sea at night. Now we're at Grand Cayman Island and we did come here to swim at Stingrays at Stingray City. And that was awesome. We saw all kinds of cool reef fish and of course got up close and personal with those giant rays. But if we truly want to see something unique, something really bizarre, the best time to do that is at night. So what we're going to do is we're going to get our dive gear ready, head out into the darkness of the sea, and get up close with some of the most alien looking creatures you can imagine. Before we could make our descent, we had to swim away from shore out to deeper water. The visibility along the way was poor and churned up by the waves, making this process much more nerve wracking than usual. Plunging into dark water is without question disorienting. And it isn't until you regain your visibility and bearings that your instincts to turn back retreat and allow you to press forward further into darkness. My eyes struggled to scan the empty space around me for a glimpse of anything. But just like that, we have our first visitor. Drawn in by my camera lights, I find these Caribbean reef squids stunning and very interesting to observe. Oddly enough, it actually might be as equally interested in me. They can be quite the characters and are extremely intelligent. It's mesmerizing how its bright coloration and translucent skin glimmer as it flutters its fins against the dark, inky water. Isn't it incredible how it can remain in perfect position with so little effort? Closely related to octopus and cuttlefish, these torpedo-shaped cephalopods have 10 appendages set in front of two very large complex eyes. And while Caribbean reef squid are normally social creatures, seeing one all alone isn't that uncommon. Wow, they really are something. What an interesting creature to kick off tonight's dive. It's a surreal sensation to descend into the black abyss of the ocean at night. Some would argue this scenario would easily rank as their greatest fear, and I wouldn't necessarily blame them. Your first night dive can be scary. Luckily, our camera lights are strong and almost create a force field, literally pushing back the fear of the unknown and establishing the reality that exists in front of us. I learned long ago that a strong sense of curiosity can be the best defense against any fear. Curiosity, like our dive lights, can illuminate our minds to focus on what we can see instead of imagining what figments may exist beyond the shadows. And in this world, almost anything my light touches brings my curiosity to a boil. The weightlessness of diving combined with this foreign landscape feels like nothing less than a space odyssey. So in the spirit of worlds beyond our imagination, tonight we are on the hunt for something truly bizarre, as I hope to encounter the aliens of the reef. Between the maze of shapes and spectrum of vivid colors that make up the coral reef, its inhabitants are equally as colorful and unusual. And as I get closer to the reef, many of the smaller creatures start to reveal themselves, like this arrow crab. As are most of its other crab cousins, 
This one is an opportunistic feeder, hunting for worms and other easy prey items. But if that doesn't look like an alien, I'm not sure what does. Okay, let's move on and see what we can find on the other side of the reef. Oh wow, so in complete contrast to the arrow crab, here we have a huge reef spider crab, also known as a channel clinging crab. This species of spider crab are commonly found in waters off of Florida, the Bahamas, and various Caribbean islands, but this one is by far the largest I've seen. We're currently at about 60 feet below the surface, but these crabs can actually be found, get this, in excess of 100 feet, a depth we don't often explore for marine life. But maybe we should search for some deep water creatures on a future dive. The walls of the reef are really impressive, covered in brightly colored sponges that tower up at steep angles, giving way to flatter coral beds. Wait, what was that? I heard a crunch like some sort of popping sound. Whoa, that's what I heard. That grunt just smashed that smaller... Oh, and look at that. There's an octopus. Did you see it before it changed color? That's a Caribbean reef octopus, and a big one too. This is definitely the all-star creature of the night. Now they can be extremely difficult to find, but once spotted, will flicker with color. And these color displays are remarkable. It's both attempting to blend in with the reef to camouflage itself, and just when I get close enough, does that. That is a defensive display. See it flash white and blue and balloon up to appear larger than it really is? It's incredible how adaptive these creatures are. Not only able to change color, but also able to change their shape and skin texture completely. Seeing these behaviors is very rare. This is actually the first time I've ever witnessed it. Now let's talk about danger. All octopus are venomous, including this one, and use their beaks to inject their prey with a toxic saliva that paralyzes them while they're consumed. However, unlike their smaller cousin, the blue ring octopus, this species does not have a lethal bite when it comes to humans. But besides their venomous ways and bizarre appearance, these animals are indeed strange. Having three hearts, 360 degree vision, and possessing inexplicable intelligence has some scientists suggesting that these creatures are indeed aliens from another world. In fact, there are few fossil records to suggest otherwise, but we'll save that debate for another video. Okay, well our computers are telling us it's time to return back to the surface, but what an epic way to end our adventure. For more photos and videos of this dive, Make sure to follow me on Instagram, at RealMarkVins, and I do respond to questions, so make sure to comment and ask away. Wow, that was by far the biggest octopus I've personally ever seen out here in the Caribbean, and by far the biggest one we've ever featured on this channel, and it showed us all kinds of crazy displays. I mean, it changed color a dozen times. It went from blues to reds to oranges to stripes, and then it had those brilliant dominance displays where it ballooned up and tried to make itself look bigger on the reef. That was incredible. I cannot believe we just witnessed that. And how about that Caribbean reef squid? That's nothing to shake a stick at either. That was pretty awesome to see the bioluminescence cascading up and down its fins. And I hope everybody at home enjoyed tonight's night adventure just as much as we did. The crew and I are absolutely exhausted. We're gonna get this gear off and head back home for the evening. While a person's first night dive can be a frightening ordeal, I have found that any journey through this mystical landscape will quickly replace feelings of fear with pure excitement. These days, whenever I have the chance to dive at night, I find myself jumping at the opportunity, literally, just as long as my light batteries are fully charged. Iceland, a country sprawling with dramatic landscapes and explosive volcanic terrain, a place that truly embodies the meaning of the word adventure with every vista and every step forth on its craggy soil. That's a volcano, just erupted eight years ago. For me, this would be my first visit to the Nordic island nation that is far more green than its northern neighbor of Greenland. However, this would be no traditional adventure. It was a solo mission. My goal, to scout future expeditions and adventures for Coyote and the crew, a mission I have led myself many times in the past. Remember those dinosaur footprints? Yep, 
I found those months earlier on a scouting expedition in southern Utah. But now, because of advancements in camera technology, I can take you with me on these exciting and often unexpected adventures. Here we go. Time to go snorkeling in freezing water. Let's do this. While on my Icelandic journey, I explored places like the Valley of Thor, rode Icelandic horses, and even got to visit a world famous spa, the Blue Lagoon. I still don't know what that is on my face, but hey, everyone was doing it, so why not? Anyways, there's one particular adventure on this expedition that I simply couldn't wait to show you. That being my journey into the icy waters of the Silfra Fissure. The fissure itself is a byproduct of the North American and Eurasian tectonic plates drifting apart, leaving in their wake multiple rifts that fill with some of the purest water on the planet. All right, guys, we're about to go snorkeling in the Silfra Fissure some of the clearest water visibility in all the world and actually one of the only places that you can dive between two continents. Literally, we are standing in the fissure that separates Eurasia and North America right now and we're gonna go diving in a natural spring. So it's very cold. We definitely don't want water getting inside our suits because it's around two degrees Celsius, just above freezing, but it's gonna be pretty awesome. We're about to go get our snorkel gear together and uh, get in, so let's go. No is that graceful? Look good? No? Okay. Well, it's gonna keep you warm, so that's what's important. As I walked down the steps of the platform, a nervous anticipation started to set in. Entering 36 degree Fahrenheit water isn't something I tend to do every day. I mean, this water is only four degrees above freezing. Safe to say, it doesn't get much colder than this. So guys, my sister's helping us out today. Say hi to everybody, Vic. She came to Iceland with me. So she's the cameraman today. But here we go. We're gonna go snorkeling in the Silfra Fisher. Time to get in. As I plunged into the water, my face was instantly met with a stinging sensation. The shock distracted me, but then suddenly, an explosion of color. This landscape was absolutely surreal, something straight out of the pages of a science fiction novel. And to top it all off, the water was 100% crystal clear. It was nearly unbelievable. The visibility in the fissure on a good day is said to extend well beyond 300 feet. And I think we can all look at this footage and confirm that that is definitely true. I can see now why so many people with the fear of heights have issues with this experience. It literally felt as if nothing was between me and the bottom of the fissure. In fact, the sensation was actually closer to that of flying than it was to swimming. That is, until I tried to actually kick with my fins. The dry suit, while providing life-saving warmth and insulation, made it nearly impossible to move. The buoyancy it created restricted my movement so much that to a large degree, I was only able to move forward by the assistance of the current. However, I will say this lack of mobility actually allowed me to relax and enjoy the experience as a whole and really take in all the color and spectacular scenery. Sometimes, it's nice to just be along for the ride. So how does a place like the Silfra Fisher come to exist? Well, as it turns out, Iceland sits smack dab on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, which is formed by the separation of the North American and Eurasian tectonic plates. In Thingvellir National Park, the separation of these plates expands nearly one inch every year. But over the course of millions of years, it has created fissures, which are filled by a natural aquifer and glacial meltwater from the surrounding peaks. This water moves slowly, very slowly. In fact, it can take up to nearly 100 years to travel and filter itself through the porous volcanic soil, making it some of the purest H2O on the planet. It is so pure, you can literally drink the water around you as you swim through the fissure. And yes, I definitely tried it out. Ooh, well, the water is cold. But I can tell you guys, this is by far the clearest visibility I've ever encountered. 
And oh, by the way, the water is delicious. It's about the purest water that you could ever drink. So it is one of those scenarios where you can't drink the water. It's pretty awesome. Iceland. While it is delicious, it is actually the purity and frigid temperature of the water that helps to create the vivid colors in the landscape of this environment. As I continued to drift along, I couldn't help but dream of coming back to dive this location with the team. My imagination was literally running wild, trying to picture what the scene must be like from the bottom of the fissure. And I was also beginning to wonder, what else might live down there? Is there something down there besides algae and troll grass? But just as I started to consider the idea of taking a free dive to find out, I noticed the battery on my GoPro, which was full 20 minutes prior, was now at only 1%. Wow, guys, the water is so cold that it's literally draining the life out of this GoPro. But before it dies, I just want to say that getting to snorkel the Sofra Fisher here in Iceland has to be one of the coolest experiences I've ever done. The ocean, a vast wilderness where life began millions upon millions of years ago. And to this day, remains one of the most unexplored environments on our planet. Within its depths live an abundance of mysterious creatures, many that often surpass even our wildest imaginations. And some of them have even emerged as the monstrous icons of our greatest fears. My name is Mark Vince. I am a filmmaker, adventurer, and director of the Brave Wilderness Channel. Together, through the lens of our cameras, You've joined me and the crew on countless journeys through the most extreme habitats on Earth. You have followed along as we've taken you closer to the world's most bizarre and misunderstood creatures than any film crew in history. And today, I am proud to say that it is those adventures that have led me to this moment, to an opportunity I have dreamt about since childhood, the moment I begin my exploration of the Great Blue Wilderness. But this is no solo mission. I will be surrounded by familiar faces and some new ones as well. With Mario taking over as director, I will proudly step in front of the camera to lead a band of aquatic explorers on one of the most ambitious marine projects ever embarked upon. Because you see, you've been along since the very beginning. Yeah! There are no rehearsals on this stage. You've seen us become dive certified and even witnessed our very first dives in the open ocean. And the adventures to follow will not only test our bravery, but our commitment to the word adventure itself. And these expeditions start now, because today you will witness our very first shark encounter. And there will be no cages. Welcome to Tiger Beach. Located off the coast of West End Grand Bahama, this location is not a beach at all, but rather a world famous destination for shark diving. More specifically, tiger shark diving. What makes this dive site so special are the powdery white sand bottoms, the beaches, if you will, that reflect brilliant ambient light through warm, crystal clear tropical water creating a very special shark diving experience that is world-class and second to none. And not only will you see tiger sharks, you can encounter up to five different species, all formidable, all top marine predators, all on the same dive. To say we were starting out our shark diving adventures in a big way might be a bit of an understatement. And with this being such a landmark moment for Mario and I, we simply couldn't imagine doing this adventure without inviting along someone very special. All right, guys, here we are. Big day. We're about to head offshore to swim with tiger sharks. This is going to be so crazy. And I think you guys know we couldn't do this without our main man. So we flew him in, especially for today. Coyote's here, guys. What's up, buddy? Hey, hey. How was your flight? Oh, it was excellent. Only a few hours to get down here. This is an epic looking boat. Permission to come aboard? Granted, come on. All right. Ugh. Are you excited to swim with these giant sharks? A little nervous, but also extremely excited. This is our first time getting to work with a predator of this size, specifically an ocean predator. So 
I'm ready to get in there with the tiger sharks. All right, well, we got your gear all set up out back. Let's go check it out. Okay, off we go. With the crew now complete and all aboard our home at sea, we set off for Tiger Beach. Some 20 miles offshore, our destiny awaited. And with it, the hungry teeth of tiger sharks. So how does it feel being the director? Uh, it's different. Uh, definitely, I used to take kind of the secondary role in the camera, but now I'm stepping up to direct. And uh, yeah, it's a learning process and I'm excited to see what's to come. Now, I think it's fair to say that this expedition was unlike anything we've ever done before. Not only was it a new challenge, it was a new danger as well. And to be honest, it was the first time I've ever experienced true fear prior to one of our trips. Oh boy. Now I know that might seem odd since I filmed everything from grizzly bears and wolverines to the world's deadliest spider, but I won't lie, I was nervous. I know the majority of my fear stem from my inexperience with sharks, but let's face it, these are sharks, big sharks with razor sharp teeth. So it goes without saying, expert guidance would be essential. And as luck would have it, Jonathan Bird and his team of Blue World Divers were available to join the trip. Jonathan and his crew have over 20 years of underwater filmmaking experience. In his Emmy Award winning program, Jonathan Bird's Blue World is in its sixth season. Let's just say these guys know what they're doing, and they had some critical advice for us shark diving rookies. All right, guys, well, we have our gear on and the boat is completely surrounded by sharks right now. We wouldn't be doing this if we weren't with an expert. And today we have Jonathan Bird from Jonathan Bird's Blue World here to teach us what we're doing and keep us safe. Is this safe? It's safe. Okay. Yeah, they're not aggressive towards divers. The only thing you want to do is just try to not be prey mm. by not acting like prey. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to wear gloves and a hood so you don't have any skin showing. They won't think that looks like fish. You know? Okay. And then when you hit the water, you want to get straight to the bottom. You don't want to flounder around like you might be something flopping on the surface that they might want to eat. So you just want to get to the sand and then once you're down there, they're going to treat you just like they treat everything else in the ocean. You're just another creature there. Okay, so don't flap and splash around on the surface. No. Trying to grab not. my camera. Just go just down. Just grab your camera, boom, right to the bottom. Okay, did you hear that, guys? We're going in. Coyote, are you ready? About as ready as I'm going to be. Let's get in there with those sharks. In addition to Jonathan's mentorship on dive techniques and camera operation, his keen sense of shark behavior would be crucial in assuring our safety underwater. After going through and prepping our dive gear, we had a final safety briefing with the crew of the ship. A serious shark bite this far at sea, even with the fastest life flights, would almost certainly be fatal. This fact was not meant to scare us, but was a stern reminder that strictly following shark protocol was an absolute must. The moments between the safety briefing and preparing to dive are hazy in my mind even to this day, as the reality of getting in the water with sharks became very real very quickly. Well, we've done all the intro shots. We're suited up and we're actually about ready to get in there with the sharks. I'm looking over the surface, check this out. Guys, there's a lot of big sharks down there. It's one thing to talk about getting into the water with these top predators. It's another thing to actually do it. So I'm a little on edge, I'd say. And I know it's gonna be cool, but there is that moment of actually jumping off the boat that I've been kind of dreading. And uh, yeah, I guess it's my time. Let's go and get in the water with those giant sharks. Here we go. The water was now thick with chum and the stench of decaying fish filled the air. My heart was pounding as countless sharks circled our perimeter and time seemed to slow down. The sight below drove fear into even the bravest among us. We all made our way to the platform, hoping to find a shred of comfort in our pre-dive routine. But nothing could distract us from the obvious. Getting in the water was inevitable. And that moment was now. One by one, Jonathan and his crew descended below, each plunge drawing us closer to the edge. Then Coyote gave me one final glance and off he went. I stood motionless as I watched him disappear beneath the surface. Mario, I'm usually really confident about everything we do, but today, man, I hope we didn't bite up more than we could chew. 
Regardless, I got your back. Got your back too, man. Let's right. do it. You ready? Ready. Let's do it. By this point, the chum had drawn in hordes of lemon sharks. And maybe it was just me, but they seemed to be getting bigger and bigger right before my very eyes. Well, with every shark dive comes the moment where you actually have to dive in with the sharks. That moment is right now. Oh boy. Then just like that, my destiny with the sharks had arrived. That's a hammerhead. That's for sure a hammerhead we're looking at. Mario, go tell the captain we need another dive. The entire boat lit up with excitement as we all raced to reassemble our dive gear. This was it. This is the moment we'd been waiting for. And it's a good thing fellow diver Jonathan Bird came along with us. His years of experience kept us all locked in on the task at hand, which was not only to get our cameras in front of that hammerhead, but was to put our safety always first <clears throat> in shark infested waters. Remember, there were still hordes of sharks surrounding the boat, but this dive was different. This was not our first shark dive. And it was all about the hammerhead. One thing that's like really cool about scuba diving, guys, is like every time you're about to go in, you kind of get butterflies. You kind of get uh, tingly and excited and you can't wait to get in. Let's do this. Let's go. You ready? <laughs> Without hesitation, we all jump back into the water. First Jonathan, then Mario, and then, yep, there I am. Once again, we drifted through countless lemon sharks and made our way back to the white sands of Tiger Beach. At this point, the tiger sharks that greeted us upon landing almost seemed like old friends. Well, three hour old friends that is, but hey, once you do a barrel roll to escape the path of a charging shark, I think that definitely makes you friends for life. But as strange as it may seem, the circling tigers almost vanished. Well, almost. Still had to keep a watchful eye on them, but the other sharks? Well, they might as well have all been guppies. Everyone in our crew wanted to see one thing and one thing only, the hammerhead. Yet, it was nowhere to be seen. I started to think, was that really the shadow of a hammerhead? Maybe my eyes were playing tricks on me. Will I forever be known as the diver that cried hammerhead? But then, it happened. Suddenly, the sand grew dark, almost like the long shadow of a thunderstorm rolling in from some far off place. We all looked up and there, the perfect silhouette of a great hammerhead shark. It glided across the sun like some kind of aquatic phoenix. But then it turned and it dove straight for me. I froze as it plummeted by. Wow, that was close. Man, the speed of that 15 foot shark was so incredible that I decided right then and there, I would be blinking a whole lot less for the rest of the dive. Of the nine species of identified hammerheads on Earth, the great hammerhead is by far the largest. Some individuals have been known to exceed lengths of 20 feet and weigh well over 1,000 pounds. Of course, more impressive than their sheer size has got to be the shape of that head. Just look at it. Perfectly designed to increase the surface area of their face to fit more electro-sensing ampullae of Lorenzini that help them detect their prey. This makes hammerheads quite the formidable food detectives, able to sense a stealthy stingray hiding beneath the sand. Just seeing this shark at Tiger Beach was an absolute stroke of luck, as great hammerheads are not common at this location. But today was our lucky day. Well, as long as we made it back to the boat, that is. Now compared to the tigers, this hammerhead was downright ornery. Between the multiple dive bombs at our cameras, 
to knocking down our dive master Houston flat on his butt, it had no shortage of tricks to keep us on our toes. It was fast, vigorous, and you know, I think its antics even had an effect on the tiger sharks. Check that out. Where was that in the last video? Of all my expectations of coming on this trip, seeing giant sharks do tricks was not one of them. But hey, it sure was cool. After around 60 minutes of putting on quite the show, the hammerhead decided it was time to take its bow. And with that, it headed back into the unknown regions of the reef. What a perfect ending to the perfect day. Woo! Dude, wow. most cooperative hammerhead ever! Is this real life? Did that just happen? <laughs> Unbelievable! In life, we are so rarely able to identify the moments that truly reshape our existence. And even more so, while they're actually happening. But the bond I form with those sharks on this day is unmistakable. They have indeed changed me forever. From here forth, I am committed to being a champion of their preservation, a true believer on a mission to educate others through the lens of my camera. A portion of this video is sponsored by Deal Dash. Our search for the lost city of manatees began at dawn, and the thick fog lifting off the water was the perfect backdrop as we ventured further into the realm of these mysterious creatures. Manatee have been tied to ocean folklore for centuries and are rumored to have been the source of many sea monster and mermaid sightings. As I paddled forward, I could hear strange breaths and tail slaps just out of sight. The light breaking through the mist danced across the water and played tricks on my eyes. And even I admit, my imagination created images of giant creatures lurking below. All right, the sun is rising, the fog is subsiding. On this trip, we're going somewhere new. We're going right to the source of the spring water. And with any luck, the manatees will accept us and come in for their close-up. As with any aquatic adventure, the moment you plunge beneath the surface is the instant you realize you are now entering a completely different world. As my eyes adjusted and I began to slowly swim forward, I noticed a shadowy figure approaching from the left. My curiosity propelled me, but just when I thought I was getting closer, it vanished like a ghost. Then I remembered, to swim with manatee you must be brave, be still, and wait patiently. So I froze and scanned for movement. Then they appeared. Seeing the first manatee of the day was thrilling. With all the news of their disappearance, I was nervous we might have come all this way without being welcomed back. If nothing else, manatee are highly intelligent. And just like their closest living relative, the elephant, it's said they never forget. One by one, they started to swim closer and eventually began to encircle me while slowly pushing our group beyond the murky channel. And since park rangers had officially opened the spring for swimming, we carefully proceeded down a narrow and rocky passage, careful to keep our distance from any passing manatee. There was a swift current we all swam against, but I was sure this is where they must have come from. The murky water eventually gave way to a crystal clear expanse, and it became obvious. I had found a manatee paradise. The freshwater springs of Florida are a manatee's favorite sanctuary for a reason. The springs stay a warm 72 degrees year round and serve as an oasis during winter months as manatee lack the body fat of other marine mammals, making them susceptible to cold snaps. I know it's hard to believe, but trust me, they get chilled easily. Although manatee can grow up to 10 foot long and weigh 1,200 pounds, they are a fragile indicator species. They do not tolerate pollution or changing climate well at all. In just the last two years, it is sadly reported that we have lost 25% of all Florida manatee. 
As I swam further into the manatee spring, they began to approach in great numbers. One by one, they would appear and then swim off again, almost to test and see if we were there for the right reasons. When you're in the water with them, there are ground rules, including respecting restricted areas, no feeding, and the biggest of all, which is no grabbing or chasing a manatee. You should always watch from a respectful distance. If they want to approach you, trust me, they will. Manatees are naturally curious and very gentle, but they are also enormous and not nearly as slow as they might seem. If they're around you, it's because they choose to be. If they want to leave, they can in the blink of an eye. Manatees are very social creatures, and when they want to make contact, it's abundantly clear they're choosing you. Almost like a friendly golden retriever, they will nudge you and extend their flipper to connect with their new human friend. This typically lasts for only a moment or two, then they're off again. However, what you're about to see is the most amazing manatee encounter I have ever experienced. Manatee have a unique language and can speak to each other, so it's easy to hear when they get excited. I don't know what this one was saying to the rest, but whatever it was, certainly had them more curious. So much so, I was essentially swarmed. Seeing this many manatee in one place was a rare and amazing sight. There must have been over 100 of them. Their eyes would follow mine and their connection to me was clear. Every time one would leave, another would approach looking for the same attention. And it was easy to get lost in the awe of their playful behavior. After about 30 minutes, I had truly lost count of how many manatee had approached the camera. And compared to my previous experiences, I knew that this one was special. And sadly, perhaps the last time I would ever see so many in a single place. I could have stayed in the spring forever, but as light started to fade, it was time to make our way back to the kayaks. And for some of us, it was easier than others. We kayaked through what seemed like a desert where seagrass once thrived, only to witness manatees struggling to feed on what little grass remained. Manatees need to eat up to 150 pounds of vegetation each day. And without thriving seagrass, we witness mothers and calves heading back out to the frigid sea to find more food. And that should not be happening this time of year. The loss of seagrass is a big factor to why so many manatee are dying, but there are also more established threats, including pollution and changing weather patterns. Each year, many manatee are struck by boats, and unfortunately, a lot of them do not survive. It is truly heartbreaking to see pieces missing from their tails, and large scars covering their entire bodies. It's also a reminder that we need to do a better job to look out for these animals if we are to share their habitats for recreation. They are so special, and aside from our furry canine companions, the manatee are perhaps human's best friend, at least when we're in the water. <sighs> Woo! Wow, it is never a bad day when you get to swim with the Florida manatee, but let's all do our part in preserving this experience for generations to come, and more importantly, their environment and source of food. If you wanna learn more about what you can do from home, check the link in the description below, savethemanatee.org. That's where you wanna to go to learn more about the issues to help this majestic species. As we journeyed home, the manatees saw us off, and I wondered if this might be my last encounter with these gentle giants. I hope we can all do our part to ensure the future of manatee. But if you have ever wanted to see one in the wild, I recommend you don't wait to catch a glimpse of one of the most endearing animals on the planet. There are less than 6,000 manatee left in the state of Florida, and they desperately need our help before they disappear forever.
It's about to be low tide for the day out here just south of Boston, Massachusetts. And this is the first time we've gone exploring in the tide pools of New England, the east coast of the United States. We film many tide pool adventures on the west coast, but I'm really excited to get out here today. These will be some debut creatures for the Brave Wilderness Channel, meaning we've never seen anything that we're gonna find today before. To throw a little twist on things, we're going to build another tide pool aquarium so we can get a closer look at some of the smaller creatures that can be found here later in the day. But before we can fill this tide pool aquarium with cool creatures, we've got to find them. And to do that, we're gonna grab our bucket, dip net, and a good set of gloves. Let's get into it and see what kind of cool stuff we can find. Here we are, the first tide pool we're going to explore for the day. And I can already see a couple of creatures we are definitely interested in getting a closer look at. Now you'll notice these rocks are absolutely covered in snails. These are a very important part of this environment. It's worth getting a couple of these. Let's go ahead and put those in our bucket. First finds of the day. Tide pooling, in general, produces the most bizarre life forms that we can feature on the Brave Wilderness Channel. Oh yeah, here we go. We got some really good rocks to flip here. Ha ha, got a crab. He's trying to pinch me, but I have gloves on. Not today. Getting some really good stuff so far. Looks pretty good. Oh, that is a great sandworm. We will take a look at these here and let them go. And the reason these aren't real great for our tide pool aquarium is they really are subterranean. As soon as we put down some of the rocks and the sand in the aquarium, they're just gonna bury. So because of that, it's better to observe these creatures right here on the surface, but let's get a couple cool shots of these. These are very neat animals, very bizarre creatures. And these are aquatic worms and they can swim. Whoa, creepy. There they go. Very interesting finds out here in the tide pool. Oh, right on my finger. That is actually a great find and is going to be a big part of the story when we build our tide pool aquarium later. I know it doesn't look like much, but believe me, when you learn more about the creature that I have in my hand, you are going to be super surprised. We're at that point where we're looking for the really difficult to find creatures. So I'm always looking for areas that just were recently covered with water as the tide is receding, uh, like this area right here, actually. Let's try this rock. Oh boy, that was a heavy one. Nothing new there. All the same. Actually, wait a second. That is a new one. That is the species I was looking for. Yeah, woo, got another one. Great, that is perfect. You can let go now, there we go. All right, cool. Haha. -ha. yes. We found quite a bit so far, flipping rocks. I think it's time to get out the dip net and try another tactic. Uh, I like this pocket here, this pocket looks really good. See how there's this low overhang? That low overhang is great refuge for a lot of creatures that might be swimming in there. We wanna do this fast. And just got a lot of snails on that one. I'll try to get underneath it's a little bit better. Oh yeah, there we go. Those are shrimp. Perfect. Look at that, that's a good one. We've got seven species so far, and I feel like that is pretty good. I think if we got one more for the day, we are ready to build our aquarium. Nope. Ha ha, I got it. That is exactly what we were looking for, folks. Okay, great, that is perfect. Okay, that's gonna conclude the searching portion of today's tide pool adventure. Now, let's make it back to our base camp and set up shop. Woo, man, that was perfect. Oh man, I didn't think I was gonna find that last one. Before we start introducing any of the creatures themselves, we need to sort of build up the environment. Let's make the habitat look like the tide pool environment that we just found these creatures in. So. The first thing I'm going to do, because this is a rocky environment, is just get some of this coarse sand. This is pretty much the look of the environment, and we don't need a ton. And I think the first one 
that we're going to add also has an organism on it. This right here is a blue mussel. And these are the exact same mussels that you see served in restaurants. They're a big part of the marine sustainability out here in New England. These mussels actually attach themselves to rocks just like this using sticky strands called bisel. Bisel is what mussels use to affix themselves so they're not washed away by the tides and the crashing waves in this environment. I'm gonna put that down in there. So let's work our way smallest to biggest with all of these type of animals. I got a few shrimp, so let's put a few shrimp in there. We will have a better chance to see them. There we go. A shrimp, which of course is a crustacean, feeds on small zooplankton and other animals, is definitely part of the cleanup crew here in the tide pool environment, but they're really cool looking. They've got a almost a zebra stripe to them, blue claws, and almost transparent. You can see all of the insides, much like a glass frog. I can see everything going on in there. Very cool addition to today's tide pool aquarium. Now, these are none other than our favorite little friends, the hermit crab. And hermit crabs are crustaceans that use snail shells that are now vacant to call their homes. And they actually look a lot more like a lobster than they do a crab. They have a long hooked tail that helps them wedge their way into the shell and stay tucked in. But as you'll see very soon, they'll start crawling around on the bottom of the tank. In my left hand, I have what is called a periwinkle. And a periwinkle is a very common snail species here in New England and in these tide pools. And in my right hand, I have what is called a dogwinkle or a dog whelk. And believe it or not, the periwinkle in my left hand is the favorite food of the dog whelk that's in my right hand. And I have to say these dog whelks are voracious predators. They will affix themselves to a bivalve like a clam, and then they will use their spiralized tongue to drill into the shell just like that, and they will slurp out their meal over a long period of time. It's pretty crazy if you ask me. Here we go. Time for the all-stars of today's tide pool aquarium. We have not one, not two, but three species of crab. This is a first. The smallest crab is an Asian shore crab. It's got really sharp claws, and then of course, two decent sized pinchers right there. Now this is one of the invasive crab species here in New England. They obviously call the Asian shore crab, come from Asia, and uh, you can identify them because they have three spines to the right and the left of each eye. Even though it's invasive, these Asian shore crabs are certainly, ah, he's pinching me, established at this point in time. So it will make a great representative of today's tide pool aquarium. Look at that, right in front of the rock for the camera. All right, time for the second species of crab for the day. This fuzzy little crab is none other than the Jonah crab. And this is a native crab. And you can tell because it doesn't have three or five spikes next to the eye. In fact, if we can macro in there past the fuzz, you would see that it has nine spikes on each side of the eye, three in the middle. The three I can actually see right there in the middle. But this Jonah crab is supposed to be here. Very cool. Okay, welcome to the Tidepool Aquarium. You make a great addition. What we have next is none other than the voracious predator of the tide pools, the green crab. Look at that crab. And this is an absolutely beautiful one. They come in a few different color morphs. This one is green and it has purple claws, purple tip claws. And I can tell it's a green crab, whoa, because it's very feisty, number one. Definitely, ah, it's pitching me oh, on both sides. Okay, okay, I'm not wearing the gloves anymore, so it definitely hurts when you get pinched. Ah, these crabs prey um, upon mollusks and the other food species that the Jonah crab that we just saw relies upon. So they are an invader and a threat to this environment. Unfortunately, they have taken hold because they've been here for over a hundred years. And the reason I got two green crabs today was not to get pinched more, which is undoubtedly going to happen. Whenever you hold two crabs, you often always get pinched. So we have both a male and female green crab so the way I could tell the difference uh, between a male and a female crab is by looking at the apron. The narrow apron is the male, the wider apron is the female. 
They do get a lot bigger than this. Green crabs can actually grow up to four inches from side to side on their carapace. Of course, that's the top of the crab shell. And they can actually stay out of water for nearly eight hours at a time, uh, which is a lot more than the other crab species here, making them a very invasive and robust predator of this tide pool. To cap off today's adventure, let's put them in there. Let's now add a few embellishments. We've got some bladder rack seaweed, a very cool plant that you'll find here in New England. The reason it's called bladder rack is because it has these little bladders of air that help it float to the surface when the tide moves in like it is right now, so that that way they can get closer to the surface to attract more light and they do need to photosynthesize to eat. A couple of really cool shells to just add the finishing touch. And there you have it. And the tide has returned. So I guess that's gonna be about it for today. I hope everybody at home enjoyed this East Coast tide pool adventure where we built another tide pool day aquarium. Now we're gonna take a couple of photos and then release all of these creatures right back where we found. Quite the adventure to get out to the location we're on today. I had to paddle out about a mile and a half from the marina here on the South Shore, just south of Boston. And now we're on foot because the water is way too shallow to paddle. We're going to park the kayak just up here and try to anchor it so it doesn't float away. And hopefully the tide doesn't come back in before we get back to the kayak. That would be a bad day. I'd be swimming a mile back to home. Kayak all the way up, grab our backpack, and we are going to head off on the greatest clamming adventure you've ever witnessed. Well, at least I hope. All right, here we go. The mouth of the estuary or salt marsh. Uh, you'll find a lot of these places have different names. And this is an intertidal zone. So that means the tide's gonna go up and down. It's full of all kinds of different substrates like pretty much pure sand, just like that. And if you just walk a little further up here, it gets very organic and rooted, almost like a, like a mossy mud. That's what's really cool about this environment. There's a lot of different looks. And this different substrate from spot to spot is also going to provide environments for a lot of different kinds of animals. Uh, but today in particular, we are looking for this soft shelled clam. This is gonna be a little tricky to get down. Oh boy. Here we go, into the adventure. Whoa, whoa, oh yeah, oh yeah. Oh, here's a crab. What do we have here? Look at this guy. All right, there we go. First creature of the trip. And this one is familiar if you've already seen our tide pool adventure in New England, which we recently released. And let's count them. One, two, three, four, five spikes on each side of the eye. Pop quiz, what kind of crab is this? If you guess green crab, you are absolutely correct. That's a good sign, healthy environment, lots of life. Now this is an invasive predatory crab, uh, not necessarily the best thing for these environments, but they are established at this point. And anytime you're looking for animals and you see other creatures, that's a very good sign. So I'm gonna let this crab go. And we're gonna talk about this. This is no longer a living bivalve, but it was recently. This is the Atlantic version of a razor clam, so they're also called jackknife clams. These are some of the fastest bivalves that live in this environment. As we get more into this estuary, you'll see there's going to be more and more shell debris around because there are a lot of things out here in this environment that eat these bivalves. This place in particular has a high concentration of soft shell clams, today's target species. I can see what we're looking for just ahead of us. Woo. All right, everybody, we finally made it. We had a long paddle out, had a long hike into this estuary, but the creature raptor is right below the surface in front of us. Now, the reason I know this is because of those. See all those little holes it's called a clam show. And it's basically a telltale sign that if there's a hole in the surface of the sand, it's showing that there's a clam that lives just below the surface. So first things first, let me get set up, get all the cameras situated, and then I'll put on some gloves, we'll start digging, and I'm gonna show you some pretty cool things about some clams you've probably never seen before. Here we go. The clams we've been searching for today that we've traveled miles to find are just a few inches 
below the surface. Now, there's no way to find these clams without getting a little bit dirty, so we're just gonna embrace it. I'm using gloves because I'm worried about getting sliced by all the shells and fragments that are in the soil. You can see some of the clam shows here. There's probably dozens of clams down in the soil. All right, here we go. Gonna dig in. Now you wanna dig carefully. They're called soft shell clams for a reason. These clams have a very brittle shell. And if you're not careful, you can crack them quite easily. And what I'm feeling for are the ridges of the side of the clam because these clams are vertical in the soil, meaning they lay on their side, um, not flat like the hard shell clams. I got one, okay. First clam of the day, this is exciting. All right, I'm just gonna move this back. Here we go, I'm gonna wiggle it out. Oh, there it is. Our first soft shell clam. Look at that one. Oh, and it's squirting everywhere. They actually are called squirting clams or spraying clams because they do squirt water out just like that. But that's a really good one to look at. We're gonna put that off to the side. Oh, okay, got another one. Let me uh, show you what I found. I'm gonna get the other camera. So if you can see down in there, that is the top ridge of a clam. And what I wanna do is just take it out just like that. Check that out. That is a nice soft shell clam. Let's see if we can find one more. You can see here, that's why I'm wearing gloves. You have all these fragments of shells down in the soil. Let's see if we can find one more. Oh yeah, here we go. There we go. Oh yeah, that's a good one. I think that's gonna do it for the finding of clams. We're gonna leave this open right now because we're gonna put all the clams back in, but I'm going to get out a container, fill it with some clear water, clean off these clams so we can take a super close look of why this is such a bizarre creature. So, all right, there we go. Let's first talk about the shell of these clams. Now these shells are very brittle. And like I said, when we were digging it up, we had to be super careful as to not crack the shell. If the shell is cracked, the clam can actually get sick and die. So we would not want that to happen. But these shells are actually made out of calcium carbonate produced by the organism itself from the things that it eats. It will build layer after layer of shell. It will grow up to a size of four inches in length. They are called bivalves because they have two shells and that's why it gets the name bi, meaning two. And this clam in particular is interesting because it cannot close all the way. A lot of uh, other mollusks and bivalves can actually close up in their shells all the way. So they're always looking kind of half open. Don't worry, they're not sick. That's exactly how they're supposed to be. You see that little nubbin? That is a siphon and the siphon has two tubes and believe it or not, this siphon can stick up to the surface eight to 12 inches. But right now the clam is taking cover. It's very bright out. So it's gonna be as tucked in as it can. When the tide comes back in and this clam is back in the soil, it will shh, put that siphon all the way up to the surface. And that's what's making all these clam shows. That's what gave away the clam's location to us for this adventure. Now what's cool about this siphon is it has two tubes, one for taking in water and one for expelling water. These clams are filter feeders. So when they're drawing in water through one side of the siphon, they're actually taking that water across their gills to absorb the oxygen and then all the food that they're eating, which is that microscopic algae in the water, goes to their mouth and then it goes all the way through the digestive system. And these clams, believe it or not, can filter up to 50 liters of water a day. And for a little creature like that, that's pretty impressive. So pretty much all day long, when there's water covering where they live, they're like a vacuum cleaner, just drinking up and filtering that water. Pretty cool. Now, the other thing that I find particularly interesting about these clams is their life cycle. They don't start life right here in the soil. They actually start as planktonic larvae. So the male and female clams will spray their gametes and their eggs into the water column through their siphons, and they will float out to sea. Now when those eggs hatch, for the first few weeks of life, these clams are actually free swimming organisms or larvae. And when they grow big enough and become heavy enough, they will actually sink to the bottom. They will affix themselves to grow even larger by using bisel, which is that spider web like strandy stuff. Now here's the really interesting part and the one that really impresses me. These clams know when they grow large enough, release that bisel and they will actually ride the tide back into the estuaries. And once they find the perfect spot with the right kind of soil, they will use their foot and they will dig down. And once they're there, 
they will spend their entire rest of their existence right in that place, which could be up to 12 years. And I think that life cycle has to be one of the most impressive things that I learned when researching this bivalve. And I'm happy that I finally got to share it with you here today and to show you these really cool and bizarre soft shell clams. All right, guys, we just got the call. We are on a sea turtle rescue mission. And right now there's a turtle on a beach about 15 miles north from here and needs our help. These sea turtles, when they end up beach, it's because they're distressed and they can no longer swim. And without programs like the one we're participating in, they would all certainly die. So needless to say, this sea turtle right now, its life depends on us. Just this past year alone, more than 850 sea turtles were rescued off the shores of Massachusetts, a number that has been sadly increasing. Endangered sea turtles like the Kemp's Ridley, Green, and Loggerhead are washing up on beaches due to cold stunning, and the changing climate is only making matters worse. I think I see it. Yep, here's our turtle. A volunteer was combing this beach and they discovered this Kemp's Ridley sea turtle. And this is exactly what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to take the turtles off of the beach, away from the wind. And then you can see it was covered here with this bit of straw to protect it from exposure. And it does look like we are in time for this sea turtle to have a chance because you can see it still has a little bit of strength in its neck, just enough to pick up its head. And that is a very good sign because most of the turtles that you find that are cold sun cannot move whatsoever. So let's bundle this little turtle up and take it to the Wellfleet Sanctuary where it will start its process of rehabilitation and hopeful re-release back into the wild. Rapidly fluctuating sea temperatures due to climate change are narrowing the window for these turtles to safely migrate south each year. Rising sea temperatures are holding the turtles in northern waters for too long, and any sudden drop in water temperature below 50 degrees results in a mass cold stunning event for these marine reptiles. We have to be super quiet because these turtles are already really stressed and loud noises have been proven to stress them even further. Oh, poor little, poor little turtle. We did notice that it had a bit of a response when we picked it up off the beach. Like it, it had some yeah. ability to raise its head. So that's pretty rare, honestly. A lot of the time these turtles are barely moving at all. Sometimes we'll think a turtle's dead and we'll leave it overnight to assess in the morning to make sure that it's still alive. Yeah. Cool. Um, is this our turtle? This is our turtle. All right. How do we know that this turtle isn't dead? So when we first bring it onto this processing table, we will check to see if its flippers are in rigor. Rigor is short for rigor mortis. When an animal dies, it starts to seize up and all of its joints and body parts become stiff. So we'll, there was slight movement right there. Saw that. Yep, we'll kind of gently tug on their back flippers and then we'll touch their eye for a small eye response as well. And then what we'll do is we will actually use this pit tag scanner here because sometimes these turtles wash in and they have been tagged and no tag was detected here. Then the next thing we'll do is we will take measurements of its carapace. We will look to see if there are any um, injuries on the turtle anywhere, sometimes from pecking from seagulls if they've been sitting on the beach for a while. Um, and then they'll sometimes have some wounds on their carapace. And, and that's why it's so important to get these turtles off the beach yes. as quickly as possible. Each animal receives a number upon entry to the Wellfleet Bay Wildlife Sanctuary. And of the four sea turtles we assisted in rescuing, number 569 was the first to be sent for urgent care. You're on your way, bud. So we quickly mobilized and followed it to the New England Aquarium's Sea Turtle Hospital. Look at all these turtles. Okay, we'll see you in a little bit. Let's go, guys. All right, here we are at the Sea Turtle Hospital. Let's go inside to see our Kemp's Ridley start its rehabilitation process. Come on this way. All right, how's it going, Adam? Thanks Good. for having us. Thank you for coming. So are these our turtles? Is the, that? These are yeah. our turtles, and you have 569, and the camps are very similar looking. And as you'll see, there's a lots of turtles everywhere. And then once they get into the water, they look even more similar. So we'll bring them up, we'll put a number on their shell, and we put a band around their flipper. Uh, so that way when we're looking for certain turtles, especially when they're in the water, they'll be easier to find. Awesome. Now we're gonna try to listen to see what the heart rate sounds oh, like. Cool. And their metabolism at this rate is very slow. Extremely slow. And that's slow. why you need these special instruments to be able to read that. We're listening for the turtle's heartbeat. So far, I just hear static. Oh, I think I just heard a whoosh. 
So this this turtle significantly lower heart rate than it's going to be when it leaves. Exactly. Okay. Yep. So with that, we will give it a dose of epinephrine that will help get that heart rate a little bit up there and a little bit more prep for a swim. So this is like the jump start for the rehabilitation process here at the hospital. Once a sea turtle receives epinephrine, it is then placed in a small pool of water for observation. Also called a swim test, this is where the clinical team will look for signs of other damage and possible infections. Let's see how 569 does. So that's a great sign, obviously, that nice little breath there. And turtle's going into the water. And so, yeah, I mean, he's ready to go. That. For these turtles, freshwater is important because of the dehydration piece. Mm. It helps rehydrate them. One or two days in that fresh water won't be detrimental, and then they're into the full salt water tanks. These turtles have been out there breathing in cold air, water, so we see a lot of pneumonia. So you can kind of see it's slowing down a little bit there. Okay. We well, also buddy. see how high in the water he is, so he's, he's definitely got some gas in his system there that's keeping him very floaty. As you can see, and he has some odd coloration in those front flippers, so he may have some skin issues that over the next few days as he warms up might become a little bit more prevalent. So I'm not trying to put you on the spot, Adam, but in your professional experience, how would you say our turtle here, number 569, is looking in terms of its potential for rehabilitation? Yeah, no, the prognosis for this turtle at this point would be good. I saw some bubbles coming out of the, okay. the nares, the nose. Then you saw him lift his head and took a nice breath. So that's all great things. Love it. That is so great to hear. And it's so nice to see the turtle lively again. I feel like most people who would encounter one of these cold stun turtles on the beach might even think they were already dead. But sure enough, here at the hospital, after a little shot of epinephrine and a chance to swim, we've got a lot of movement. All right, so now that our turtle has swam for the first time at the hospital, part of the rehabilitation process of warming them back up to the appropriate temperature, which is about 72 degrees, takes a few days. After treating nearly 5,000 turtles, this facility has learned quite a bit about how to bring the temperature back up in the appropriate way. And the best way they found to do it is a stage process over days using multiple tanks. Over the next two days, they will actually be placed in the saltwater baths that will raise them up to about 65 degrees and then eventually up to the 72 degrees that you'll see here in the holding tanks. These turtles here, they're already being raised up to temperature pretty cool and definitely something that really helps these turtles stand a chance of being re-released. Along with being critically endangered, the Kemp's Ridley is also the rarest sea turtle on the planet. Once abundant, their population suffered a massive crash in the 1980s, where as few as 250 nesting females were estimated to remain. Luckily for the world's smallest and rarest sea turtle, large-scale conservation efforts help restore their population to stability by the mid-2000s. However, with current climate trends being as they are, the pressure is now back on to save this species from extinction. I've heard reports that the Kemp's Ridley are somewhere in the population of 30 to 40,000 individuals in the world. Is that is that what you've heard also? They are a critically endangered population. So, I mean, the fact that you're seeing thousands of turtles come to the facility, this is a, a significant mass yes. of this species. You know, getting these guys through and back into the ocean is critical. Well, this is not the end of the road for the video, guys. We actually have one more step that we want to show you as part of this turtle rehabilitation program. This one, though, is going to take us on a short trip to the airport. So as you can see, we are no longer in the Sea Turtle Hospital. We are in an air hangar because there's an amazing volunteer program called Turtles Fly 2 that takes these sea turtles down to warmer waters in the southern United States where they will finish their rehabilitation and be released back into the wild much sooner than Mother Nature would allow here in New England. And we just got word that the turtles arrived, so it's time to get to work and load up these sea turtles. All right, so we have a van load and a truck load full of sea turtles that are being loaded up by volunteers and aquarium staff onto this aircraft right now. They are trying to set a record today by loading 100 sea turtles onto this airplane. That's a lot of reptiles. So right now the pilot and the co-pilot are up there playing a little bit of turtle Tetris to try to get all of these animals loaded up onto this aircraft. It takes a lot of resources to fly these turtles, so they want to make sure every flight is efficient and as productive as they can. Trying to get one more up there? Yeah, I think they have a little shirt of banana nuts. Okay. Nice. Oh, there's more turtles. <laughs> There's always more turtles. <laughs> Last one. 
Okay. Yeah. Thank you. No, thank you. All right, got the uh, the final turtle box to load into the aircraft. Last one. Something I never thought I would say. Turtles on an airplane. But here in New England, it happens about a dozen times a year. That's cool. The turtles that make the flight to Florida are the ones ready to be released back into the wild. But others needing more long-term rehabilitation, like our friend 569, will continue to receive care at the Sea Turtle Hospital until they are ready to be released when spring returns to New England. Researchers have predicted that by 2031, just eight years from this video's release, thousands of cold-stunned sea turtles will wash up on New England shores every single year. It takes an amazing collaboration to combat these events and return healthy sea turtles into the ocean to rejoin their populations. From emergency veterinarians, to airplane pilots, to hundreds of beach combing volunteers, I was so proud to play a small part in saving these rare and endangered animals. But the work continues every single day from the cold shores of Cape Cod to the warm waters of South Florida. And these wildlife heroes need our support. Please join Brave Wilderness in the New England Aquarium to donate, spread awareness, or perhaps volunteer yourself in the effort to save these beloved treasures of our oceans.